thousands of California soldiers are being forced to repay enlistment bonuses after a decade, that's right, a decade of going to war. This is according to LATimes.com. It reads, short of troops to flight in Iraq and Afghanistan a decade ago, the California National Guard enticed thousands of soldiers with bonuses of $15,000 or more. Nearly 10,000 soldiers, many of whom who served multiple combat tours, have been ordered to repay large enlistment bonuses and slapped with interest fines, wage garnishments, and tax liens if they refuse. This is crazy. This is crazy. There's one gentleman here, uh, he's, he's quoted as saying, people like me just got screwed. A quote from uh, this guy, according to the LA Times, says, these bonuses were used to keep people in. His name is uh, Christopher Van Meter. He served in Iraq as a captain. He continues to say that he refinanced his mortgage to repay $25,000 in reenlistment bonuses and $21,000 in student loan repayments that the Army says he should not have received. So that's almost $50,000 that he has to come up with or face charges, penalty, uh, interest charges, wage garnishments, all sorts of crap. What this man needs is Donald Trump. Donald Trump, as a young man, really, really tried to get into the Army, but damn it, his, uh, his weird foot condition held him down. Ugh. People. This guy. Uh, okay. So, and then also, as you know, Donald Trump is really, really, really big on paying his employees. Big record of that. I'm Brian Crawford. You're listening to the River's Edge Radio Network. We're broadcasting from the beautiful Millville Studios, which is partially under construction, so if you hear anything weird, that's why. You can hit me up on Twitter at RiverTalkPGH, or you can hit me up right here, right now, at 412-407-2PGH. That's 412-407-2744. The River's Edge is uh, the web website, riversedgepgh.com. Sorry, I like literally woke up and, and ran into studio. It's powered by NGL Web Tech. They're honest, practical, and affordable you can go to njlwebtech.com for all of your web servicing needs. It's been like a rough day. I had a bad day at work, and I've been so tired lately, so I decided to, to take a nap before I came in. I missed my alarm. I wake up, and I see a message from Matt Geica saying, Hey, can I come in and talk about the Steelers today? And I said, Of course you can come in and talk about the Steelers today. I'm waiting to hear back from Matt Geica to see uh, what time he will be in, but he's going to come in to talk about the Steelers' loss to the New England Patriots, which was not as severe as I had expected. I thought this loss would be much, much worse. But really, it, uh, it wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. We have a an interesting go uh, Godzilla. Yes, yeah, kind of a, a gorilla weird news story in... The spirit of Harambe. So we've got that coming at you and more. Liz Victory, who's going to perform, who's going to be performing on the political panel November 8th, 8 p.m. at Cousins Lounge with live election results. She was driving around and she saw a weird, interesting house in Homewood. And the house was decorated on two sides. One side was a Hillary side, and one side was a Trump side. I'm assuming it's a married couple who has decided to not build a fence between the two of them, but allow the two of them to, I guess, work together collaboratively and uh, each have one half of the house to support their own candidate. I will say that the Donald Trump side of that relationship seems to be the side that is winning. Uh, Hillary had a little, an interesting little uh, sign. There was like, it was a real like weird colorful sign. And there was the generic Hillary for America type of sign up there in the front. But he had this crazy sign. His sign was insane. And his sign 
had a life-size cardboard cutout of the Donald. So that was pretty badass in a way. But pretty cool stuff in Homewood. People need to be more like that. We talked about this last week, how people need to be okay with someone else having a political, a different political position than their own. So, I don't know. I like what's going on in Homewood. I think that's what we need more of here in Pennsylvania. All the candidates keep coming by. They're all stopping by Pennsylvania. And I, I was listening to Trump's Gettysburg address and giving his 100-day in office speech. And uh, it seems like he wants to do his entire campaign platform in his first 100 days. So I'm not exactly sure how that is going to work out. But we do have Matt Geica here. We're going to bring him on. We're going to talk a little bit about the Steelers and uh, some other things. How are you? Great. Do we have to talk about the Steelers? <laughs> Actually, I thought they did better than I expected they would do. They did. I thought it was going to be a big blowout, and it was, uh, I mean, it was a loss, but it wasn't catastrophic. It wasn't embarrassing. True. I guess it's a lesson in managing expectations, much like Donald Trump. If he only loses by a handful of uh, percentage points nationally, it'll feel like a success for him. So True. Well, the election's similar. rigged anyways. So. Oh, yeah, right. Exactly. We already know what's going to happen. So, uh, yes, it was odd for me, Brian, because this might have been the most negative I've ever seen Steelers fans about a game for a team that was reasonably expected to contend. I guess there were teams back in the late 90s, maybe a few years back when uh, they were around 500 for the most part that people weren't that excited about. But this one... Like I said, for a team that people thought was going to be a division champion, still might be a division champion, it was just really weird because we went from all this pre-existing hype, and I think everyone was excited about the Patriots matchup for weeks, and yeah. then Roethlisberger gets hurt, and it's like, well, they're going to lose by 30. So it's kind of amazing how quickly everyone, or most people that I talked to, capitulated. And then, as you said, they were in it until the fourth quarter. Yeah, and I thought with... Roethlisberger being out, it was going to be a bloodbath. To be honest, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was going to be really, really bad. <laughs> Funny you use that word because uh, when I was out and about yesterday before the game, I had someone say exactly that. It's going to be a bloodbath. So <laughs> uh, you were not alone in that assessment, and uh, rather grotesque, but I guess appropriate considering we're in the Halloween season. So yeah. so why not? And it really wasn't uh, until uh, about what uh, the first five minutes of the fourth quarter. So if you're into moral victories, which you might have to be in this case, considering how hamstrung the Steelers were without their all-pro quarterback, then uh, you were probably pretty happy with that performance. Yeah, I, I know I, I was, actually. I was really, uh, I was expecting the worst. I was pleasantly surprised, and uh, see where they can go from here. But you know what? They keep surprising me this year, because I thought they were going to have a rough start as well. Same here. And yeah. they really didn't. I mean, losing only one game, despite all of the different people who were out for injury or suspension is really pretty mm -hmm. impressive as well. It has been. I think, though, yesterday, not having Martavis Bryant, who was out for the season uh, due to that, uh, that marijuana suspension, I think that was the first time I really noticed his absence because previously Roethlisberger had been able to at least stretch the field with Sammy Coates, who is uh, a younger wide receiver, but one who has similar speed to Martavis Bryant and can uh, can make the defense at least honor, take a step back and say, okay, we got to cover this guy. I don't think Landry Jones threw in Sammy Coates' direction on a pattern down the sideline or at all until the fourth quarter. I forgot he was even active <laughs> on Sunday. Wow. I'm thinking, oh, number 14, that's right, that's Sammy Coates. So that was the one spot where not having Roethlisberger in there, and, and Landry was just trying to, to play it, not safe, but like you said, be decisive, don't make the big mistake. He did a couple of times uh, with some poor throws, but for the most part, it was underneath. It was to Antonio Brown. It was comfort level stuff for him. But that's tough to do against a team like the Patriots that tries to take away what you're you're comfortable with and, and makes you do something that you're not uh, comfortable doing. So I think that it played out eventually, although it was a, a game effort through three quarters. What do the Steelers need to work on during this bye week? I think on, on defense, they still need to figure out, well, Ryan Shazier played well yesterday, and so did Jarvis Jones, so those are positive developments, but uh, assuming that Cam Hayward is going to be back in two weeks, so there's the bye week coming up, and then they'll play at Baltimore to start November, assuming Cam Hayward is back, 
Uh, that might fix some of their quarterback pressure issues. They got to Tom Brady a few times yesterday, and I thought you saw Tom Brady look a little rattled in that second half. He threw a bizarre shovel pass. He was scrambling. He's not the quickest guy. If you can knock him off his spot, you, you can do some damage or at least make the Patriots relatively ineffective. But overall this season, they've had issues getting to the quarterback, and that's what it's all about. Uh, it's a quarterback league. It's a passing league, so... And that applies to both sides of the ball. If you can if you can pressure a quarterback, if you can make him uncomfortable, then you can succeed. Uh, I don't think we've seen enough of that. And uh, honestly, the, the running game has hurt the Steelers too. So I'm still wondering if it's scheme on the defensive side or if it's personnel. Uh, Keith Butler's had a, a couple of years now uh, since Dick LeBeau retired to run that defense. And he hasn't had a really good stretch yet where uh, they've been dominant or at least or at least effective for a consistent time. And uh, that's the one thing that, that may not come uh, this year, depending on whether, like you say, you, you believe the talent isn't quite there or, or, if it's, uh, or if it's a scheme thing. So what else is going on? What else is? Well, we're still waiting for Sidney Crosby's return on the Penguins yes. side. And uh, they played a really rough game in Nashville. They've had two terrible games on the road so far. Yeah. In Montreal and Nashville, not even close. And uh, some would point to goaltending. I wouldn't necessarily. I thought that uh, there were some questionable decisions on the back end for the Penguins. Justin Schultz getting caught up ice. Ole Mata, again, looking a step slow. And uh, the Predators had their way. When they were, um, well, when they were able to, to break into the zone with the puck, it seemed to be a two-on-one or a three-on-two or a three-on-one. So uh, those are preventable types of chances against uh, if you're the Penguins. And it comes down to decision-making, reading the play and reacting. And uh, some of the decisions that they've made on the back end with the puck uh, have not been good in these road games. I don't know if there's any kind of rhyme or reason to that pattern, but that's what's happened so far. They'll be at home against the Panthers on Tuesday. Sidney Crosby, we haven't heard yet. This is Monday morning. They haven't practiced yet on Monday. So from all that I've heard from uh, Josh Yoey, my colleague at DK Pittsburgh Sports, He's been progressing. He's been skating almost every day. He's taken just one day off since the start of the year. So that's a positive. I imagine they'll try to get him into some contact situations in practice. And they'll have, I think, three off days this week. So an opportunity to get him into some practices, which appears to be the only thing that's holding him back from returning. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm interested to see how they do this year. And everyone, like you mentioned before, they jumped the goaltending. That seems to be the, the first thing that everybody just, it's an easy decision with the, with the Penguins as far as the Penguins are concerned. But. It's like the quarterback in football that's the most visible visible position for, I don't want to say the uneducated fan, but perhaps the, the new fan or, or the, uh, the fan who is a, a casual hockey follower as opposed to someone who uh, knows the ins and outs of the sport. And th that's what happens. You're going to have, you talk about, well, to tie it into politics again, you talk about low information voters or one issue voters. There are one issue and low information sports fans too. Who are just looking at the goalie, looking at the quarterback, uh, in baseball, looking at the the pitcher? I guess I'm not sure what the equivalent would be there, uh, but in hockey and, and football, there's definitely an easy way to go with your criticism or your praise, and and that's the way that the most do in that situation. I imagine with baseball, it's probably just your biggest star. Because I yeah, know, that's that's probably a good point. Yeah, because yeah. because in Pittsburgh, I know everyone likes to to focus on McCutcheon. Well. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's having a down year at certain times, but he can't affect the entire team or, you know, other teams. I'm sure it's a pitcher if it's a, an all-star pitcher or something like that. Right. Well, as I've talked about on, on my program on Fridays here, baseball is the one sport where the star has the least influence because you got to wait your turn in the yeah. batting order. You can't give the ball to McCutcheon or give the puck to McCutcheon, as it were, in hockey and just hope he makes something happen. And you can't. Uh, as well on defense, the ball has to come to you. You can't range from center field to, to first base or vice versa. So uh, that is also, you could argue that's the ultimate team sport. You talk about football or hockey, but in those games, you still have teammates or, or players that have outsized influence. But in baseball, you just got to, it's a democratic sport, man. You, you got to wait your turn yep. and uh, everyone gets an equal chance to influence the play. Speaking of baseball, who I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who's going to win the World Series. I think it's an easy call. It's the Cubs in five. The Cubs are the best team in baseball. They have been all year. And I think at the end of that Dodgers series, we finally saw them play like they did for most of the year. And when it's a smaller sample, a best of five, best of seven, anything can happen. But 
once they got past the opening round, in fact, and I may have said this on my show too, but I'll say it here for your audience as well. Once they got past the best of five, that's the biggest stumbling block for the better team is the shorter sample. So uh, once they beat the Giants, they came back at that big rally in game four. I felt really good about their chances to win the World Series even more so than before. They were down 2-1 in the series against the Dodgers, won three in a row to advance to the to the World Series. The Indians are, are a sharp squad, but I think finally their, their lack of starting pitching, they have two guys... Uh, who uh, in their rotation who are basically out for the year and Trevor Bauer hasn't been able to pitch. Uh, so there's a third that uh, that have been on the shelf for them. So it's been basically Corey Kluber and the dominant Andrew Miller out of the bullpen. But the Cubs overall offensive depth, I think one through eight, they can hurt you. I think that prevails in this series. And even though the Indians have the, the home field because of the, uh, the all-star game, I have a hard time picking against Chicago. Wouldn't it be crazy that if Cleveland does win and then they oh, win the World insane. Series yeah. after they win <laughs> the NBA? I mean, that'll be that, – that, that would be crazy. But, yeah. No, they, I, they go a half century without a, ch a championship or more, and they're on the verge of getting two in four months, I guess it would be. or Yeah, four months. And we were talking – remember you had me in on this show right after the Cavs won, and you yes. said uh, – Mike Breen of ESPN said Cleveland yes, is yes. the city of champions once again. And I said, you know, that's a pretty fun call for him. And you were saying, well, it's a little early. And I mm -hmm. agreed with that. But <laughs> they will be the city this of champions. Be it, yes. <laughs> they will have – Cleveland will have two bef uh, since Pittsburgh had its previous one yeah. if the Indians do win. So that blows your mind, doesn't it? Which really also says something about us since it was really only a few months between – Sure. The last and, one in our and Pittsburgh doesn't have a basketball team. Well, so, true, yeah, true. That's a little that's unfair. True, <laughs> Very true. But it will be wild and uh, strange times. And the Cubs haven't even been this far since '47. So uh, that's or '45. Pardon me. World War One or World War Two rather was still going on, and they haven't won a series since before World War One. Wow. That's all you got to say, right? <laughs> yeah, I was watching a, an interesting little thing they had on the news about the Cubs talking about all of their bad luck over the years. And apparently an, an actual black cat yes. made its way onto the field. And I'm thinking, my goodness, like, <laughs> how does a black cat even make it into a professional baseball stadium? And what kind of luck do you have to have to be the one team that has that cat appear and walk across the field? Right. All, all the talk is about the curse of the billy goat. And if you want to look that up, you can. It's goofy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the black hat thing might be the, the most uh, impressive part of, of that curse, if you want to call it. That was in 69. The Cubs had a big division lead against the Mets. And uh, during the, the span in which they blew that lead late in the season, that's when that black cat walked in front of Ron Santo, one of the Cubs stars in the on-deck circle. I believe it was at Shea Stadium. Uh, so, <laughs> wow. again, uh, th those were interesting times. A little bit easier, I guess, for felines to get on the field back then <laughs> but we did have that squirrel that went on the field in the world series a couple of years ago so sometimes you know uh, you can't keep everyone out you can keep the streakers off the field occasionally but not not the animals well in today's day of uh, of acceptance you have people could just bring in a dog for dog night and it can identify as a cat and then run across and then <laughs> wow. there we go the, the the pup night has been popular it has been <laughs> they have so. several of those at pnc park now which I'm not sure I'd want to bring my dog. I wouldn't trust my dog to not crap all over the place. In, I just don't know where you would setting. put it. That's like my thing. Like, yeah, you can't put it in the seats, right? I mean, do people do They have that? a special section. I think okay. they have them out under the scoreboard in okay. left field. And still, it, it's it's a little troublesome at, at, at times, I would imagine. <laughs> I'm sure that maybe the dogs get into fights with each other. Maybe. Don't have cat and dog night on the same night. That would be trouble, that too. That would be crazy. Yes. <laughs> All right, Matt. That's all I got. Much. That's all I got. <laughs> Thanks. All right. We're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we'll have your weird news. You're listening to The River's Edge. Would you be interested in developing conscious choice? Would you be interested in creating reactions rather than waiting for one to come? Would you be interested in combining serendipity and synchronicity? Would you be interested in making one plus one equals three? Would you be interested in finding out about full impact mindfulness? If so, I challenge you to join myself, Jim Ellermeyer, a cognitive behavioral health therapist, every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. on the river's edge where we will challenge you to allow us to help you help yourself to fully participate in your life. Let the adventure begin.
So a zoo in London has gone bananas. A 400-pound gorilla, Kumbuka, escaped from his enclosure at a London zoo on October 13th. And apparently he was, uh, he was walking around. Some armed officials showed up and they were ready to contend with the mayhem, according to the Huffington Post. But he wasn't looking for trouble. I guess he was looking for a syrup. They caught the ape chugging a giant thing of sugary syrup. So, uh, more ape business. Apes are, like, going crazy now between Harambe and now this. I love the memes that are going on with Harambe. Have you seen the Harambe memes? They're fantastic. There's one meme out there that... Uh, actually, it was an event that they had, which was jumping off the Clementi Bridge for Harambe. People are just going crazy over this whole thing. And uh, I think it's hilarious. It's great. It's, uh, it's, it's good stuff dealing with Harambe. And I just think it, it shows that the nation, we as a nation have determined and realized kind of how silly a lot of this Harambe business is. Yeah, I mean, it, it sucks. It's sad. It's important. But it's definitely funny. It's entertaining. And uh, I say keep it up. Keep fighting the fight for Harambe. The Pittsburgh Symphony, the strike is starting to really affect the symphony overall now and it, it kind of brings up an interesting situation and I, I don't fault the musicians for striking and I'm never going to fault someone for fighting for the best contract that they can get but it's now starting to hurt the symphony in the pocket and the symphony itself is already struggling that's one of the reasons why they don't want to to pay more to the musicians and if your strike ends up destroying your employer to a point where your employer can no longer pay you anyways, then maybe the strike is going a little too far. I, I feel for them, though. I do. In my job, I'm bound by a union contract, and I'm considered a new employee. And a new employee, up until now, we didn't uh, get any benefits whatsoever. We didn't get the, the pension plan. We did not get paid holidays. We made less money than someone who got converted to what they call a regular status. So I can understand where these people are coming from in the symphony. And I don't know. I, I hope they can come to a speedy resolution because it's really... It would be a real shame if it gets to a point where the symphony itself becomes a shell of what it used to be. I love going to the symphony, and I don't know what the, the answer is to attracting new fans, new, uh, new people to, who will go to the symphony and enjoy it for what it is. I know they've been trying to do things to become more modern. They try to... To bring in modern music and have the symphony play to modern songs and things like that. But personally, to me, that almost takes away from what the symphony is. To me, when I go to the symphony, I want to I want to listen to all you know to the old stuff. I want to listen to Mozart. I want to listen to Beethoven. I want to listen to uh, you know my favorite song is Concertino for Four Percussion, which oh that song is awesome. If I could play that song for you, I would. I don't know if I have the... I guess I could play a, a little clip. Let's see if I can play a little clip. Concertina for four percussion. I can play a little clip and uh, let me see if I can just bring it in somewhere in, in the middle of the song because I, we can't play a lot of it. This is it. But this kind of stuff here, this is really, really good stuff. And I don't want to see this type of music chased away. I don't want to see this type of music chased away from Heinz Hall and from other great venues across the country because younger people aren't showing up. So I, I don't know how to get people interested 
in symphonic music, in uh, a wind symphony, because the music is unbelievable. I had the, the honor of playing this song by David R. Gillingham back when I was in high school. It was part of, actually, believe it or not, they converted Concertino for Four Percussion to a marching band song, part of our performance there. And that was great. Back when I was in marching band, they would use symphonic pieces and convert them to to make them accessible to a marching band performer because obviously when you're walking around and you're marching and in today's marching band world it's not just marching you're also practically running around on the field doing almost like dance moves it's become very 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 acrobatic in in recent years i was kind of on the 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 fence when i was in marching band where they still kept some of the old traditions, but they were trying to make it more of a work of theater. And all of the the bands that you really respected played, at least in my opinion, played symphonic wind symphony type music, concert music, and they converted it, and it was wonderful. Nowadays, even the bands such as Norwin, where I went, they, they still play this type of music, but then they also have a second show for football games, which to me kind of defeats the whole point, but the whole purpose as a concert band of going to a football game of, of a competition band, because, oh, I'll just put it this way. When I was in high school, we were a competition band at Norwin, and we really didn't care about the football games or the football team. My freshman year, we would actually boo the football team as they approached the field. They would come onto the field and we would yell, boo! They suck! And all this other stuff. And they deserved it. They did suck. And they were douchebags to us because they were jealous because we would go win national competitions and the football team would lose the loser bowl every year. And they would make comments about us. So they deserved the the vitriol and the dislike and the jeering and all of that good stuff that we were so happy to provide. But over the years, that has eased up, and I think that's a good thing. You don't want the football team and the band at each other's throats, especially when the band is forced to go perform at the football games. But it's gone so far the other way, where the band now has a second show that is just geared towards the football team. And even though we viewed the football games as a waste of time when we were there in the band, it was just another night of the week that we couldn't go out and do what we wanted to do. We had football games on Friday. We had band practice and band competitions on Saturday and practice almost every other day throughout the week. Uh, literally, actually, it was every day and night except for Sundays and one day during the week during the, the school year. But you had band every morning regardless. So it pretty much was your life, and it was just another day that you had to go out, and you had to get on a bus, and go perform before a bunch of people who really didn't care that you were performing. They weren't there to listen to the band. They didn't like your music. They didn't care what you were playing. But at least that was another performance. That was another performance in front of a crowd, and though it may not be a crowd that appreciated you or a crowd that really wanted you there— at least it was performing in front of a crowd, and that was another experience that you could use to prepare yourself for the show that really mattered the next day, Saturday night, at whatever high school or college stadium you were performing at. So, I just don't want to see this type of music die out. It would really, uh, it would really make me sad to see something as wonderful as concertina for four percussion die out. And this song was so cool because this particular song, if you played it from the beginning, there's really a, a low moment. It's a very silent song through much of it, and you really have to pay attention to hear what's going on. And it forces you to pay attention. And again, not really apt for a football game, but for a a concert especially, or even a, a band show where people are really tuning in, it was pretty cool. And being in Norwin Band was really an awesome experience as well because they were known across the country. 
across the country, really, for uh, their prominence. They they once won Grand Nationals, and they won Grand Nationals playing a performance that was called Nobody Does It Better. Next week, we're going to talk about Kathleen Kane. Or not next week. I'm still used to doing a weekly show. Wednesday, we're going to talk about Kathleen Kane. Her fate will be determined later today. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. She's the attorney general who has a slew of charges, most principally with the the her attempt to, well, she leaked information about a grand jury allegedly for political reasons. And we're going to find out, well, I guess it's not alleged, she, she was proven guilty, but we're going to find out today what her sentence is and if she gets jail time. Isn't that crazy? The top prosecutor in the state facing jail time. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? What a world we live in where this is going on. What kind of, how, where do you, how do you live in a world where the attorney general is facing jail time? I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Look at Hillary Clinton running for president. But I don't know. It's wild. We, uh... I, I don't even... It, it, I'm, I'm so sick of talking about the election. I just can't wait to move on. I, it's going to be fun on November 8th. But it's going to be a last hurrah that uh, I'm going to enjoy. But it's going to be a sense of relief. Because I could stop talking about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton for at least a little bit, right? I mean, they got to get sworn in. We can go back to, uh... We can go back to trashing Obama and Paul Ryan and Governor Wolf and all of these other people that screw us, screw with us every day. But I'm looking forward to the end. I'm looking forward to the end. But I am looking forward to talking about Kathleen Kane because it's a huge story. It's a story that really is as big as the email scandal itself. And I, I still can't believe people don't think that that's a big deal. I, I still cannot believe that people don't realize what a big deal that email scandal is. I mean, that's horrendous. Horrendous. I don't know. Well, I'm going to back to Trundle Manor tonight. So that's going to be good times. We've got a Culture Cruise episode up on there. Ian Insect just had a performance there, and that's going to be out on video at some point. But I really want to see that. That place, if you haven't been there, you've got to go check that out. Trundle Manor. So I'm heading there tonight, but we're going to take a quick break, and then we're actually going to play a song. It's called The Mansion by The Existential Gentleman, and I don't know why. This band always reminds me of Trundle Manor. It's just very they, – they remind me when I hear them of kind of Halloween and creepy shit that's going on. But we've got them up, and we've got a promo, and then I'll be back with your holiday of the day here on the River's Edge. Well, go! It's green! Come on! Go! God damn it, Brian! You need to calm down yeah, with the road rage. I'm sick of these people, uh, these assholes. The road rage, man! You got to calm down on the road rage. Well, I'm on where, or I want to get to where we're going. We have a lot of great stuff coming up. We're going to the Falling Water, Bicycle Heaven, the Mattress Factory, Tuck Knob, Trundle Manor. All right, which way do I go? Which uh, way do I go? Come on, right, come on! Right. Too late now. Right. Come on. Well, too late now. You know, I got to keep going. I'm not going to sit oh, here like some asshole. Oh, come on, man. All right, you're listening to the Culture Cruise. You can find us at riversedgepgh.com. Your local Pittsburgh area museum podcast. Yes, riversedgepgh.com and come take a ride with us. So today is actually 40 hour work week day. Today is the day to celebrate a 40-hour work week. Does anyone actually have a 40-hour work week anymore? I feel like people are either severely underworked or overworked. Like where I'm at, I could be working a 12-hour day on a whim. No notification. You just come in and it's like, hey, guess what? You're here for 12 hours today. And I know so many other people who have to work like two or three jobs just to make ends meet and try to get to that 40 hour work week the other day at work someone told me when i came in that i looked sad and i responded i'm always sad when i come to this place this hellhole this rat's den 
That's the world I live in. Does your job suck? Tweet me at RiverTalkPGH. I can't wait until all of this, the river's edge, takes off and I can just quit my job and then just do this for eternity. That would be fantastic. Don't forget, Cousins, November 8th, we have the election night party. And it's also going to be live election results. We'll have that for you live. We have an elite panel. We're going to give drop little bios of the panel throughout the week, throughout the coming weeks. But we have List Victory, Mike McMullen. We have our friend Sean Logue, Aaron Watson, and of course, Brian Crawford, your wonderful host, the sexy voice that will get you through the evening. But I do have word, this just now posted in Facebook on the Facebook election night page that Cousins Lounge will be serving up $2 PBR pounders, $5 12-inch cheese pizzas, and if you bring your voters stub in, you will receive $1 off your first drink. So get out and vote, and then come drink with us at Cousins, 8 p.m. on election night. Mike Sasson's in tomorrow, 10 a.m. here on Pittsburgh's Voice for Local Music, the River's Edge Radio Network.